Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. We got an awesome show for you today with the one and only William Duvall of Allison Chains fame. And uh, this is a good one. We're going to have to get multiple stories from this episode animated, don't you think? I, I, I've i already reached out to a couple animators to see like how much it would be. Because one of the stories, I don't want to give anything away, you know, no spoilers, but one of the stories is it has to be animated. It's so vivid and he does a, such a good job telling it. But uh, this is a great episode. So, so happy we finally got William Duvall from Allison Chains. Uh, on the podcast today. This is episode 679. And I got to start with the shout outs because we are less than one month away from Milwaukee Metal Fest. And so hype. Dude, I'm getting hyped. It it's, is. It's wild. I look at the lineup all the time and I'm like, this is the most crazy lineup I've ever seen in a festival. And everybody who who's already gotten their tickets, like you're, you're my hero because we are confirmed now definite for 2024. Uh, just just by the reaction. So if you haven't gotten your tickets, do so ASAP. Go to therave.com slash metal fest. There's still payment plans and there's a single day, two day and three day passes. And there's now a ton of new meet and greets available at martyrstore.net. If you want to upgrade, you'll see the exclusive shirt that's just for the VIP meet and greets. You'll see uh, the, you know, if you want to introduce a band, if you want to meet Paul Bostaff from Slayer, I mean, there's, we're, it's going to be a lot of fun. So a uh, big thank you to Chris Labar from Elkar, Indiana. He's going to meet, be meeting Machine Head. I think Crowbar. I think Napalm Death. Also, Gareth Thompson from Eddyville, Kentucky. Thank you so much, Gareth. Randy Chambers from Burlington, New Jersey. Randy, I got some handwritten lyrics going out to you. Thanks for supporting MartyrStore.net. And also Jason Trom, who's going to be uh, who's going to be meeting. Paul Bostaff from Slayer. Thank you, Jason Trom over there in Rochester, Minnesota. This is for you. Thank you for supporting the show. This is my way to let you know. So thanks again, Chris, Gareth, Randy, Jason, everybody who supported martyrstore.net. You'll see the, the new meet and greets are up there with the additional items. We have drumsticks. We got VIP shirts that are they're not going to be for sale at the show only online beforehand you pick everything up at will call um and we're going to have the stage times released this week so big thank you to indiemerchstore.com who's going to be having a stage named after them because not only are they a huge supporter of the Jossa show they were really excited and uh supportive of the return of milwaukee metal fest and they just launched the angel maker pre-orders uh i'm sorry they just they just put up all the leftovers from Angel Maker from this uh, Body Snatcher tour. And uh, there's there's a ton of killer merch up there at IndieMerchStore.com. Just use the promo code uh, JOSTA10 and you'll save 10% off. And they also, that band just released a, a, a really great cover of the Black Dahlia Murder song, Death Mask Divine. So be sure to check that out on your favorite streaming platform. Big thanks to Indie Merch Store. The code is JOSTA10 when you go to IndieMerchStore.com. Also, thank you to Manscaped. Manscaped.com promo code JOSTA is going to save you 20% off plus free shipping. And Monarch Heavy, they are another uh, great label who's going to be out there supporting us at Milwaukee Metal Fest, one of our official sponsors and now a sponsor of the JOSTA show. Go to MonarchHeavy.com after the podcast today and use the code 666 and you'll save 15% off you'll see they just uh I, man i didn't even know hit texas hippie coalition was even on the label I just saw I just, that there. that's so crazy we we played with them in texas and they they of course they you know people love them uh but they also started the somnuri pre-order for their album desiderium desiderium how did you say it desiderium you yeah and and Som somnuri's playing with me with just and friends at the pre-party on uh, May 25th at the Rave, and it's free for all the bands and crew. So big thank you to MonarchHeavy.com. Use the promo code 666. And last but certainly not least, Century Media, another one of our great Milwaukee Metal Fest sponsors, CenturyMedia.store. Bro, Century Media is on a roll. They're on a tear. Sanguasugabog, Unearth, Suicide Silence, Lorna Shore. They're putting out some bangers. I mean, it's all my favorite bands that are still doing it. 
for real uh, and they're uh, and they're signing label. a bunch of new bands that are really good so and century media is uh had they've been super supportive of the festival and of the podcast and we're, we're definitely going to have them back in 2024 they've been great big thanks to century media dot store no more no, no promo code needed let's talk to william duvall from allison chains now on to the show my friend, the lead singer of Hate Breed, the infamous and notorious Jamie Jasta is in the building. That's what's up. Jamie Jasta from the metal band Hate Breed. That guy's famous. Coffee, death metal, and push-ups. That's Jamie Jasta. Remember Jamie Jasta? You know him. He's a podcaster, but he's also he's a metal man. I would say you need that. That shit is hard. <laughs> Show everybody, William Duvall of Allison Chains. Fame finally got you on the podcast. Been talking about you on this show for I think seven years. Oh wow, man! Well, thank you, thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. My pleasure. Do you remember the show with Romstein, Allison Chains, and Hate Breed in <laughs> Bergen? I think it was Bergen, Norway. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, vaguely, I, I do. I do have a, a vague recollection of that. Was, yeah, we're going back a ways, but yeah, man. Yeah. Going going back really far before I started the podcast, but that show was memorable, me really memorable to me because you guys came out, no like real, in, no crazy intro tape. They got all the fire and the dicks and the shooting fire out of dicks and foam out of dicks. and But you guys just come out. I don't even remember if there was a real like intro tape and you just kind of wave to the crowd and it's like to da to da na 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 and the whole place is like fist in the air. I was like, wow, that's hard. It's almost like what else are you gonna do with Romstein? Do you accept just yeah. come out right like, punk rock? Right, right, right. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna out pirate. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> those yeah. Yeah. Maybe take a take a more straightforward approach, you know, might be the way. Yeah. Yeah, was that like a, a conscious decision, or were you told like, uh -oh. okay, I, you know, you're you're limited on this? No, I don't think we were ever told anything like that. I think it was just a matter of uh, this is what we do. Let's just go do it. You know, uh, we've never uh, in more recent years. Well, no, let me say let me say this. We've always been conscious of our of our production value when it's truly you know our show or headlining or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, while we put in a lot of time into that, when circumstances allow for it, um, at the same time, we don't really rely on it. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't need it to go out and do what we do. So in a case like what you just described, that was one of those times where it's all right, we're just going to go out and do our thing, you know? And, uh, it's nice to, to, uh, be capable of, of both where your production hopefully complements what you normally do, but it's not a crutch, you know, um, every sound that we, every sound that you hear coming through the system is the four of us. It's, we've never had any assistance, you know, any tracks backing, whatever. We've never done any of that. And, and, and again, by that same token, we've never, um, relied on well, a lot of heavy visuals or anything. It's a nice compliment when you can do it. That's about it. Yeah, no, it was amazing. I was, I, cause I was up in that little, I don't know, it was like a side house that we had for like a band room or whatever, but you could just look out over the, I, I, I don't even know what to call it. It was some sort of castle or some sort of, I forget what it was. It was a beautiful scenery. And I just thought, man, respect to Alice and Chase. Cause they can come out strictly just, just go right into it, just riffs in your face, and the crowd is going bonkers. And uh, and that three piece as an opener, that's probably the hard. Like, did you did you sit with Jerry and go, "Here's the three that we're gonna open with on a big ass heavy show like this," or whenever you're playing on a, with with a Metallica or a Rob Steiner, one of these big bands? Do you talk about coming out of the gate that hard with with uh, what was it, Damn the River? Um, them bones. I forget what the third one was, but I think it was a heavy one too. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll sit together and and uh, you know go over a set list and just think of uh, different ideas for what to open with, and uh, and then think about 
pacing throughout the show after that. It, it always, um, well, I should say m most often it depends on how, how long we have, like, what is our time side? Are we doing a, a quick 50? Are we doing more of a, a, a 60 or a 75? I and mean, those things make a difference too. Um, so you take, take those parameters and then, uh, and then you just kind of assess the situation, right? What, what kind of, what kind of thing are we dealing with here? You know, and like you say, a situation like Bergen, Norway, um, you know, it was, uh, it was like, yeah, it's outdoors and, uh, and it's, it's, it's not our gig per se. Um, and then, so you tailor, <laughs> handle your set list for that circumstance and come out swinging yeah because on the there was a there was a whole to do last august when your rehearsal like list got out and it, it obviously wasn't the set list but it was like the cheat sheet or like the sheet saying like these are the options that of all the songs that we're going to rehearse and there was some deep cuts in there and songs that hadn't been played um but but do you prefer the deep cuts or do you like the hits because the hits get the big pop? Uh, I like a really nice combination. You know, there are times when I think all of us to some degree or another maybe wish that we could work in more, more deep, deep album tracks as, as they, as they say. Um, but again, the show more or less dictates the circumstances a lot of times, like the, the, the context. Um, so whenever we feel that we can do a, a, a set that some might say is, uh, more indulgent and maybe includes more of those deep tracks, we do it and we really enjoy that. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, there's, there's certainly a lot of times where I wish we could go more in that direction than we sometimes do. Um, when we've done it, I've really, really enjoyed those tours, you know, cause I think of it more in terms of tour cycles. And so I can think back, you know, I don't know, gosh, I mean, I've been in the group 17 years now. So we go back a decade plus and, uh, maybe we just had black kids way to blue out or maybe you know even before the, the second record even before the dinosaurs record those sets when we were headlining theaters say those were really kind of interesting drawn out <laughs> experiences but you know the more albums you do together the more songs that you have that fit into that category of uh, album tracks that you wish you could play, but maybe won't be able to. And the more material that, that, you know, you're stockpiling, the harder it gets to come up with a set list. We've had some of our biggest disagreements over, over a freaking set list. It's the truth. So it's some of the hardest work you can do is just coming up with that list, you know? For sure. No. And especially once you had hits with the band too. I, I, I remember looking up some of the set lists and seeing like, check my brain is third. And I'm like, that's hard. That's a great, that's a great, that's a hit that stands up there with all the great Allison Chains hits. But, uh, what is the, what is the Mike Inez like, uh, set list beef? Like, cause I can never picture him being mad or angry. Like I don't, I've ne he's, he's gotta be up there with like Dio and the nicest guys in, in <laughs> rock and metal. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it, you you it, see the real. It's not as though it's not as though furniture's flying around the room, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I mean everybody just has those things. Oh man, wish you could. Oh god, wish. Oh, I wish you could do this. No, or man, why don't we just come out? Like you know, Mike would be the guy. Like man, why don't we? Can we just why don't we just come out? Do this. I don't just you know like and and sometimes we do it, and sometimes we do exactly what he's suggesting. You know. And, uh, but there are times when all of us kind of uh, lose out <laughs> for the sake of the show. <laughs> right. I, I guess if it's like a theater gig and it's headlining to your diehard or it's an evening with or you just have one support act, yeah, then the time would allow for you to experiment a little more or, or yeah, delve into some deep cuts or, or depending on what the, 
you know, rehearsal was like leading up to it. But, you know, I always, I always look at different bands. I like set lists. And when I do see the deep cuts coming out, I think it's great. Some of the fans that are sort of fair weather or maybe, you know, don't know the recent album, obviously they can be vocal and, you know, go online and go, oh, they, especially with, I, you see like with like bands like Iron Maiden, like they will come out and do just the new, the newest release in full. But have you, have you guys ever done anything like that? We had not. Um, but I really, I admire that, uh, that sort of, uh, approach too. Um, you know, just here it is. Take her, look at it. Yeah. You know, I can dig that. I mean, and I mean, gosh, looking back, uh, you know, Black Flag used to do that kind of thing where it was, we're going to come out, we're going to do what we want to do. And if you happen to dig it and great. And especially from my war on, they kind of were just like, this is what we're going to do. And it might have some, 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 some golden oldies, you know, peppered in there, some crowd favorites, but it's going to lean really heavily on the newest thing. And they had that one year where they put out, a, they put out like three records in 1984, back to back to back. Like, I think my work came out in like March or April. And then they had family man somewhere during the spring, summer, and then they had slip it and come out in November. And the tours were just, this is who we are now. If you like it, great. If you don't, there's the door, you know? So yeah, I, I, I dig both. Um, Alice is in a really fortunate position to uh, have a lot of songs that maybe weren't singles in the strictest sense of the word, but that uh, that still become crowd favorites. So it's a kind of a nice mix that that you can do. Where hey, yeah, there's there's a lot of songs that are straight up radio singles. There's a really big handful of those, and then. There's this subset of these are album tracks, you know, in, in, in terms of like, you know, these would be defined as album tracks, but a lot of people know them. A lot of people really dig them. And then there's the deeper, deeper tracks. So yeah, my favorite sets tend to mix all those up together. But if you have to combine yourself to just the first two, you still, you still got a pretty strong list, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think stylistically though, it's pretty, your era of the band is pretty in line with the previous era. So I, I could never see you, you know, uh, facing that sort of combative audience, like black fat, black flag. Mm -hmm. That's the worst, that's the worst word to have a slip up on. Right. Especially with the people taking, uh, <laughs> people taking everything out of context, <laughs> put it, put it up on, this on... is going to get edited <laughs> and it's just going to get looped. <laughs> so why? <laughs> black flag brian make a timestamp. um the uh the audiences i think were hostile because yeah. that was at that time where and, and i don't know this is pre this is pre my era and i like there's only a certain era of black flag that i like and i know that there are fans you're you're about what 10 years older than me i'm 45 yeah i'm exactly 10 years old yeah okay so you saw both the eras of Black Flag, right? Like you saw when they started getting real miffed at the punk and hardcore scene that wasn't oh yeah, kind of yeah. feeling the more avant-garde, what would you call that, post-hardcore? What, what what was their genre lean? Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's an interesting question because that they always wrestled with labels and they never wanted to be pigeonholed. That was a big thing, so... Um, you know, it's been called various things, you know, their, their metal period or whatever, or, um, yeah, I guess post hardcore would, would fit as a term, but they never, they never liked any of that and, uh, pushed back against it and just kind of did their thing in spite of it all. And that's when I got, that's when I was, that's when I got to know those guys during sort of the hype. And so I got to see what they were thinking behind the scenes as well as how they presented themselves on stage. And it was a real uh, strong, you know, it was that, it was almost like Zen level, fuck you. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, yeah, it was, it was fuck you, but very just composed. And we're just gonna calmly 
and intently do what we do. And it's not even about making some big show out or saying, you know, yeah, fuck you, you don't like it. They didn't even have to do that. Sometimes Henry would get into a thing with a particular member of the audience or a particular little group, you know, that was really giving it to him hard up front, like obnoxiously doing stuff to him or whatever. But for the most part, they just sort of steamrolled it right through it. And it was quite a lesson for me uh, as an aspiring, you know, musician. Um, and as a kid who was, you know, in the midst of playing my first bands, this was really like a great up close and personal, like master class <laughs> in, in like how to just do what the hell you want to do, no matter what is happening around you. Like it was pretty cool. Yeah. And, and they were all in sync with that. There was, cause they, they seemed to famously implode. And I always wonder like, was it? just the riff between Ginn and him, or was it um, because the those records, I guess, were not commercially successful, but they've they've gone on to be commercially successful, right? Like, that's kind of like the audience caught up with some of those right. later records. Yeah. I, I, I don't think there was uh, much of a beef within the band about the music, you know, the musical direction per se. I mean, obviously, you know, best to ask them but from what i remember kind of being around them um you know i think any kind of personal issues are the kind of issues that happen in most bands and it's and you got to remember too they were touring in very very rustic conditions i mean they were henry slept in the rider truck amidst the pa cabinets and the rest of the guys were crammed into a van that, you know, might be made for eight people, but they got 13 people in there. You know what I mean? So they were, it was always close quarters. Nobody had any money. Everything was going back into the band, back into the, into sustaining their, their thing, you know, the label SST and sort of the culture that they were advancing throughout the, the world. Um, Cause they really were for a while there, they were kind of a, a a launch in himself. They really were a very cool um, sort of cultural affront, you know, because they, they always brought their own SST bands to open the shows and they traveled with their own PA. They were really self-contained. So I think any beefs may have had to just do with everyone's kind of living rough and, and it's, it's intense and you're and they're, they're God, they're scheduled. Look at those tour schedules. If you ever want to really like <laughs> look back on Whoa, you know, like I'm just, and especially the touring musician. If you ever want to, if you ever want to blow your own mind, look at a Black Flag tour schedule circa like '84, '85. You know, like, and you just see like, wow, twenty five in a row, <laughs> or you see like ninety eight shows in a hundred and two days. Okay, you know, that's a way to do it. Um, so yeah, I think it was mostly just that stuff. It was just intense. Yeah, definitely. And and talk about just the drives and then the venues and then no maps. I mean, well, no, uh, yeah, no, like, geo, uh, what do you call that? Like, no GS. Yeah, you got no GPS. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and bands breaking down, trucks breaking down, like, everything you can imagine, right? And, you're, and, it, and it all falls to you to handle it. There's no, there's no safety net. You know what I mean? You're your own safety net. Yeah. So I, I wonder if something subconsciously like entered your brain then seeing like, cause that he, cause he's not the first singer, but they went on to have success with him. Right. And you know, you, you certainly didn't deal with that combative type of audience, but you definitely dealt with some haters in the beginning. Um, what was that like? And, and, and what is your, how do you deal with a heckler? I'll, and then I'll tell you how I deal with it. <laughs> I know you don't deal with many now, but you must have at one point. Yeah, I mean, uh, there there have been a few occasions that I, I remember really early on, uh, probably would have been that first run through Europe that we did. We did a run through Europe in 2006. And there was this one show we played in Madrid, and it was in a like a bull ring. And it was, 
I think it was a free show. I mean, they just sort of let anybody in there. And so there were all these people in there. And there was one guy right down the front, and he's just screaming all this stuff, I mean, you know, in Spanish, right? But, I mean, I know enough to know it was really, you know, vulgar. <laughs> it was... He, he, he was he was making his displeasure known, let's say. It was very abusive language. And um and I'm just dealing with this song after song. And I probably had a, a bit of wine <laughs> backstage, maybe even had some on stage. Um but at a certain point I was like, all right, this is enough of this, right? And that's when the another side comes out. Um, and my thinking at that point was, because, you know, again, they let everybody in, so there's no security, there's no nothing, right? And the way this guy was yelling, I had to wonder, is he going to do something? Is he going to try to get up here? Does he have something on him, you know? And so while I'm thinking all this, you know, and I'm still singing, I'm still doing my thing, right? And, and you know, there's 5,000 people in this boring, pretty much like 4,999 were having a really great time, right? So I don't want to make it all about this one fucker. But at the same time, I don't want to hear it anymore. And so at a certain point, I just remember thinking like, you're going to have to get up here. And... If you do, it's going to get really, really, really fucking bad. And I got right down in his face. And I remember like, because he was right there in front. And it was no barrier. So I got right down in this guy's face. And I remember staring at him. And I was like, the mic like this. And I remember grinning at him really hard. And I was seeing the lyrics. And I, and I, and I was... I. I I was changing lyrics to fit the situation, like to, to be at him, you know? And then at a certain point, I just laughed in his face really loud on my, it was more like a cackle because I was kind of, you know how you get to that place where you're kind of coming out of yourself a little bit and you're like, I was thinking to myself, I'm not going to put hands in this guy, but I'm very prepared for him to, fucking put a hand up on me right now and I just want to see what we're dealing with here and I really want to find out I want to know what are you made up motherfucker what are you made up and I remember getting right down <laughs> you know and at that point the whole crowd kind of turned and they turned on him and a little while later I didn't see him anymore so I don't know what happened I don't know People just like, you know what, get the fuck out of here, man. You know, and they just dragged him on. I don't know what happened. Maybe he gave up and went home. I don't know. But I never saw him again. And then we went on with the show and it was fine. And I never, I never said anything about it on the, you know, sometimes you can get that thing. Like, should I call this guy out in front of her? But I didn't do any of that. I just dealt right with him. So anybody that wasn't in the immediate sight line of it probably wouldn't have even known anything was going on. But, you know, but he did. Yeah, that's pre ute days too, or or pre camera phone enough where YouTube was around, but not mm -hmm. the quality it is now with the quality of phone cameras and stuff too, right? So those were the good old days. Actually, yeah, the good old days was was, was, <laughs> was if you very last was, of those days, yeah, very last. If you had gone back, if you know, because I'm picturing you thinking on stage like, don't make me go back to the black flag, you know, loving. Uh, William, don't make me go back to hardcore punk William days where I got to bust this dude in the face. But if you did that and then, you know, they get a footage of it and you got a lawsuit in Spain, which why didn't they have like enough security on a bull ring like that? I wonder. Maybe I just, no, you know, it's just, it's just that whole period's kind of a blur because we were, we were doing a lot of shows that, the, that was still like the schedule was pretty intense and the whole, the whole situation was really intense because we were still trying to figure out what we were made of, you know, and, and we were still taking, we were doing this in public. So the whole period is just this 
kind of crazy blur where, you know, there's, it seemed like there was a show every night. I mean, the, and then there were, I know for a fact, I remember vividly, there were a lot of four in a rows kind of thing. So we were playing five, six nights a week. And, um, so there literally almost was a show every night and there were a lot of drives. It was the closest that a band like Alice in Chains gets to that kind of punk rock touring kind of thing. You know what I mean? Where at least in terms of the schedule and, uh, the intensity of it. And we were trying to see if this could work. We were trying to see, you know, if it worked for us, if it would work for the, for the people. So I don't, I don't remember many details about that show other than that, but you know, that whole time was crazy. <laughs> the whole time. It's, it's, it's great when the audience just sorts it out and you don't have to get involved. My new thing is I just go, I just focus on whoever's having the best time and I zone in with them and try to connect with that energy. Cause I don't want to give anybody their moment or, or give them a thing like where they get you and they, they say, cause that's really what they want is they want the attention. They want to be single now. Yeah. But, I, but I remember, I remember you touring with them at that time and thinking, cause that's pre, that's all pre the first record with you. Correct. So, so, so the thinking is all right. And, and I don't know, you tell me if, if this is right or accurate, the, you're going out and you're playing the catalog and the audience, I remember everybody that I knew saying, this guy is fucking amazing. Wait till you see him. It was, I, you had done something, I think televised too, yeah. right? Yeah. It was with, for a heart or. Yeah. That was my very first appearance uh, was <laughs> in an arena in New Jersey for television. <laughs> but yeah, no pressure there. That's the way to start out. But yeah, that's what it was. It's a uh, VH1 decades rock live and they were honoring heart and Hard. heart had this uh, idea to have some special guests as part of their show. And so Alice was one of those special guests. And so they gave Alice and Chains like a little three song subset of their, of their show. And, uh, and so, and within that, uh, some guests, some more guests were invited to be part of the Alice segment. Um, so uh, Phil Anselmo uh, was there to sing, and Duff McKagan played guitar on stage. Right. And um, so that was interesting because you have a tele you have a you have a show that's going to be edited down into a television program, which means a lot of things are going to end up on the cutting room floor. And so um, I went out and I did Man in the Box. That was sort of my allotted song. Phil came out and did Wood. I remember and, now, yeah. Uh, and then Ann Wilson was was supposed to sing Rooster. And so at some point during like, the rehearsals of the camera blocking, um, you know, we're all standing there and say, like, okay, we want to go to the director, stage manager, all that. We're, okay, we want to do Rooster, guys. We want to do, you know, we want to run through Rooster. And Anne wasn't there. And so, um, you know, I just sort of stood in so they could get the camera blocking and they could get the audio and all that. And uh, midway through, I look to my right and I see Anne and Nancy standing in the wings. And so at the end of the song, Anne comes over to me and she says, you got to do Rooster. You, you have to do, you have to sing that, you know? So she gave me her slot with 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 Alice in Chains, who was this band that, you know, obviously she'd known them from the beginning. And that's why, you know, Alice was invited to participate in the show. And this was going to be her big moment with, you know, those guys, right? And and have this sort of Seattle homecoming thing on stage between the different generations of Seattle bands. And I mean the newspaper was talking about it in advance. Wait till you hear Ant and St. Rooster, you know? And she gave it to me. And the thing about it is, if she hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't have been in the show. Because when it came to the time limitations of the program, they cut Man in the Box. Because, you know, they're going to have Phil Anselmo in the show, right? Um, I mean, if it's a choice between Phil Anselmo and this relatively unknown, you know, like, 
underground musician, right? They're going to have Phil. And so the way I ended up in that show was Ann Wilson giving me her slot as singing rooster. And she was on stage with us and she, you know, you know, she's standing right beside me for a lot of it, but she gave it to me and I'll never forget it because that, that made it all real. I think not only for me and for the other three, but also for the people. Yeah. Especially because the fans that rallied around you, that were like, this guy's amazing. He's perfect for the job. They started to become really vocal online and you need that. You need, you know, you need the, the, you don't want people to be indifferent, right? You need some love. You need some hate because it, it all helps, right? And then I think that also made it so that way once the record did come out, I mean, people had high expectations, but we didn't know it was going to be that good. And and I that, that that's coming from a, a diehard fan that I was like, wow, I kept just listening to that record over and over again. That, that 2009 is such a good year for records. I don't know if something was in the air or in the universe, but yeah. there that was just a great time. But Ann Wilson is the coolest, hands down. I mean, she is she's like a an alien, like a different. I don't even I don't even know if I'm the same species. He's one of the greats of all time, and uh, and she's she was great enough in that instance to even step back and hand it over to someone else. I mean, that's real, that's true greatness because she could have obviously destroyed it. She could have been great. She would have slayed it, you know? Um, but, you know, she had the grace to hand it off, you know? And it's just, yeah, really another another great lesson uh, for me as a as an artist. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a great story. Quick interruption, letting you know today's episode is brought to you by Manscaped. That's right. The trimmer that's not just for your balls and your taint and your asshole anymore. It's the trimmer for your beard. They're stepping it up and now they're selling a ton of beard products. They've gone from waist to face, helping you replace that bulky razor with their brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. They sent me one and I got to thank them. It's it's awesome. And I, and I like all their products. I even use their lip balm. I use their their shampoo, their conditioner. I even use their deodorant. But they dude. got ball deodorant in case you got stunk balls. <laughs> in case you got a couple of stinkers down there. My father used to tell a joke. He says, what, what do you call a farmer with sore balls? And we're like, what? And he's like, a couple of acres or something. I don't know. I fucked the joke up. <laughs> That's, I get it. <laughs> you you saw where I'm going with that. Manscaped.com, promo code Justin, you'll save 20% off plus free shipping. While I have you, support our friends at monarchheavy.com and come see the band Somnuri before they're playing right before uh, us and Yotuma. So it's Justin Friends with Paul Bostaff at the pre-party at uh at uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest, Thursday, May 25th. It's free for all the bands, all the sponsors. Or there's single day tickets if you want to just come to the pre party with Jocelyn Friends and Somnuri and Yotuma. It's going to be a great time. And go pre order Somnuri's new album, Desiderium. Brian, how do you say it? You nailed it. Desiderium. Desiderium. The pre order is up now wrong, at but... monarchheavy.com and you will save 15% when you use the promo code 666. So that's very easy to remember. Just hit the six three times on your keyboard and you're going to get 15% off the new Desiderium record. Uh, the new d- album called Desiderium by the band Somnuri, who's playing with Justin Friends and Yotuma at the Milwaukee Metal Fest pre-party at the Rave Bar. Also, they have the Creeping Death Boundless Domain pre-order, and we're, we're, we got our fingers crossed that we're going to get Creeping Death on uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest 2024. But you'll see all the other bands and, and uh, merch and great deals they have over at monarchheavy.com, M N R K. H E A V Y dot com promo code six six six. Now back to the show. What what's a what's a a second front man or front woman that you liked that you saw uh you know get in the gig? And do I need to make a Duval in chain shirt like my Dio Savage shirt? Do I need to make that? Do I need to make that that would be I bet you that would sell a do Oh <laughs> like, my goodness gracious. Uh D I C um, yeah, uh, and, uh, well, you know, I, I saw Brian Johnson, uh, with, with ACDC for those about to rock tour. Um, that was great. I mean, they came out, 
it was around Christmas time, and they came out uh, straight away with the cannons. The wind in the hell. What year was that? It was that would have been late eighty one, early eighty two. Uh, one of my first like concert concerts that I really wanted to go to, you know. And um, that was that was a cool period because I saw Van Halen on the Fair Warning tour in eighty one, and then ACDC. It's probably like I said, I remember being around Christmas time because they they started out with Hell's Bells. No, okay, I said cannons. Not right. They started that. They started the set by lowering the big Hell's Bell, which is how they used to start back then. But what I remember about it was because it was the holidays, they had these Christmas elves come out and do the the bang the bell. You know what I mean? Like that was that was their nod to the the holiday season, right? And it was cool. It was really it was cool that juxtaposition of here's these guys in Christmas hats with this menacing hell's bell and then Angus up on top of the PA starts it off. It was, it was dope. It was really good. How long after that did you start uh, rehearsing with your own bands and get your own uh, music together? The next year because wow. now, big, the big pivotal uh, moment for, for that though, for me saying, okay, I'm going to start my own bands and, and write my own songs. That was seeing the decline of Western civilization in the, the first one, the first decline in the movie theater. It came to Washington, D.C., where I was living at the time in 81. And I think it was maybe around this time of year, like April-ish kind of. Um, could be wrong about that, but it was, it, was, it was early part of 81, I think. And it I remember begging my grandfather to take me to see it because I'd been reading about, you know, some of the bands. I'd been reading about what was what was happening in Los Angeles, and of course, I had, I had some memories of the English punk thing and the New York punk thing, but nothing firsthand. It was only what I read in magazines, and um, you know, and it seemed far away, and especially the English thing because the Sex Pistols that was a very that was very sensationalist the whole way that was treated in the mass media and Sid Vicious and his death. All that stuff was highly tabloidish, you know what I'm saying? So and it it didn't take away from the music, but it sort of overshadowed the music in public consciousness. So this thing coming out of LA, you're hearing about this American, like it was it was like now it's happening in another part of America. It's not just New York and CBs. It's it's Los Angeles and the bands are harder and faster, more extreme and all that. So I was like, whoa, this sounds really interesting. And I heard that name, Black Flag. Wow. Whoa. You know, it just sounds, you know, you know about the insect spray, but it was like something about even just the, the recontextualization of that name with this music that you're hearing about this harder and extreme, more this and more that. It's faster, louder, everything you want. I was like, whoa, I want to hear them. And they were in the decline of Western civilization film. So I was like, I got to go see this movie. And of course, they're the first band that gets to actually do their little performance segment in the film, you know. And from the first second, you know, Greg Ginn starts White Minority and I see that Dan Armstrong plexiglass and I just, and the whole band just sort of explodes on stage. They had Ron Reyes singing for them then when the film was made and it was just one of those my my first real musical epiphany was hearing Hendrix band of gypsies at eight years old seeing black flag and decline western civilization sitting there in that movie theater with my grandfather beside me of all people <laughs> was my second musical epiphany the Hendrix thing was like I gotta play guitar I gotta play music and I started playing at eight years old but the decline I was like you know 13 14 I was like I got to play, I got to start my own band. I don't, I, I can't wait anymore. The, you know, this, the idea that I have to be a grown up to do it, or I have to be in the exact right place, the right time, all that went out the window. It was like, no, I got to do this now. And then the next year, 1982, um, as I was, you know, again, just holding my focus and, you know, trying to kind of meet people, but you know, you don't even drive yet. So it's, it's hard, you know, you're just in middle school. And, um, 
But right then, I started hearing about the the scene happening in the Washington, D.C. area. And I was like, oh, man, I want to go to a show good here. You know, I want to actually see this this kind of music in person, you know. And then my family's like, okay, your, your dad got a, got a promotion in his job. We got to move. We're moving to Atlanta. <laughs> So it was like, oh, okay, got to go. <laughs> got to leave everything I know behind. Got to leave all my little friends and everything. And and uh, and so we land in Atlanta in summer of 82. And, uh, but I didn't let, let, I did not let the dream die. If anything, it, 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 it got more, you know, intense. Cause it was like, oh, I know I really got to do this. Cause there was nothing going on in Atlanta at that time. It was like, Moving, you know, Washington D.C. had all that Discord stuff going. On. Atlanta had nothing. Atlanta was still bar bands playing Molly Hatchet, you know, maybe a little bit of new wave, right? I mean, you had the Six Eight Eight Club that was going. That would be the place like Iggy Pop would play when he came to town. You had the Athens scene, you know, the B Fifty Twos, the right. really early REM, who were cool, by the way. I saw REM when they were just starting. They were freaking dope. You know, but it just wasn't the kind of music I wanted to do. I wanted to do the harder, faster, louder, more extreme. I want more noise. Like Black Flag kind of was the perfect uh, thing for me to point at and aspire to because, again, I knew about the New York scene. I had heard the Ramones. I'd heard the Sex Pistols. But I imagined something even more, more extreme, noisier. I and I love like the Stooges raw power record. I, I bought that record, you know, with my own money, like at, at Harmony Hut at, at the Columbia Mall in Columbia, Maryland, in the discount bin, you know, for like three ninety nine or something. But like, I wanted something that took all that and then just pushed it even further into craziness. And that's what Black Flag was. That's what I wanted to do. So moving to Atlanta, and then you get put into the local high school. We actually didn't move into Atlanta proper, like in city. We moved to, you know, the suburb, you know, in DeKalb County, we moved to Decatur. <laughs> so I got put into local high school, you know, and, and, uh, of course, you know, no one wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> Culture shock. About. No, one, yeah, it was a school run by the jocks, you know, football team ran in school, you know what I mean? A guy waved murder, typical old stuff, you know. And I'm this sort of, you know, geeky, bookish, you know, kid, you know, with my freaking members only jacket on with a black flag pin next to a, a talking heads pin, you know, and, and no, I'm, I'm, I'm there trying to get somebody to listen to me talk about the bad brains. They just don't want to know. So eventually though, I found this one kid played snare drum in the marching band. And, uh, so he gave me the time of day and he lived one street over. So I was like, man. You gotta come over to my house, man. I wanna play this stuff, you know. And then I found this other kid who uh never played an instrument, but he was just kind of this cool stoner kid. He could kind of walk between the worlds a little bit. Like jocks wouldn't mess with him, you know, and 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 he was cool enough, you know, he was he was just he was handsome enough, the girls liked him, but he kind of wasn't a part of any one group. And he also lived in the neighborhood. He was like a street over. So I got both those guys. I was like, man, guy, you just gotta come on, man. This is what I'm trying to do, you know? And I, I had the war cassette from the Bad Braids. And I had, by that time, a couple of Black Flag singles that I had bought at, at Wax and Fax, the cool local record store in, in, in Little Five Points in Atlanta. And, and then I had the very beginnings of my original songs that I had started writing in my room, in my bedroom. So I had those guys over and they listened to all that stuff, you know? And I was like, man, you know, I want to do something like this, you know? So that's what started my first band, Awareness Void of Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> that was the name? A-V-O-C, dude. Yeah, I wanted like a four, uh, a four letter acronym, you know, cause I was, I like T-S-O-L, I was like, that's dope. Yeah. True Sounds of Liberty, I was like, that is, or True Sounds of Liberty, you could go both ways with it. And they, they made it stand for different things over time. But like, I love that. I was, everybody had the three letter acronym. I was like, man, I want that four letter acronym. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I want awareness for the chaos going. Yeah. And, uh, and then we started getting gigs in the city and that's what led to, that was, that's what led to all that happened afterwards. Like that, 
that's what led to me meeting more, you know, kids who were, who, who kind of were getting into this music and who didn't know what to do or where to go. And we all kind of, you know, it was a small, small group, but we all were, you know, like-minded in that way. And there was a time where that was enough to form a friendship. Just, just knowing about a certain band or having that certain single was enough to form a bond because nobody else liked this kind of stuff. And in fact, everybody else hated it. And so you really had each other and that was it. And then, you know, so my first two gigs were at the 688 Club, which was not an all ages club. By stroke of fate, luck, whatever you want to call it, by late 80 or summer 83, we started hearing about the Metroplex. That was the first all ages place. And it was perfect timing. And, you know, because we were 15, 16 years old, you know, like 18 was, was to me, that was old. You know what I'm saying? Like we were kids, kids, like learners permit kids, you know what I mean? And like, we just wanted to play the music and listen to the music. We didn't care about all the stuff that went along with it. The fashion, the, 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 the drinking, any of that stuff. We weren't interested. I wasn't interested at all. So we needed a place to play where, you know, six and eight, I would have to be on the bill just to be allowed in the building, you know? If my band, if AEOC or whatever didn't get the opening slot on, you know, the Dead Kennedys gig, then I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to be in there. And in fact, that happened. They came and played, Dead Kennedys played 688, May 83. I snuck into the club and was in there. I was like, I'm safe. I'm good. You know, because there was enough people around. Like, I'm good. You know, and then Steve May, the manager, he found me. He was like, oh, no, no. Come on. We walked me. Well, you know, it was a heavy thing, though, because they had a liquor license to protect and they had, you know, the cops were all over them. You know what I'm saying? They were they were the one place at that time where you had anything left of center going on. So they were always under surveillance. They were always rewatching. Somebody was always waiting for them to mess up. So he just couldn't afford the liability. You know, I mean, I get it now looking back, but. At the time, God, it was a drag. He walked me to the front of the club, to the front door. They had a payphone right across the front door. And he watched me while I called my mom. And and I got my mom on the phone, you know, and it was like, huh, I got, you know, I got kicked out. And she couldn't get me. And she's not happy at all. And she's on her way to the club. And I'm out in the back of the club by the dumpsters, just throwing rocks and all mad, you know. Jello Biafra comes out the back door and he's like, what seems to be the trouble? And I'm like, yeah, they won't let me in a gig and they're so underage. I don't even care about drinking. You know, like, he's like, well, that sounds like South African style apartheid, you know, and like, <laughs> so long and short of it, he agrees to be, you know, take responsibility for me for that night. He agrees to sort of like quasi guardianship for that one gig, you know? And I was like, wow, okay, awesome. You know? So of course I can't call my mother. She's already on the, on the road. And this is pre cell phone, pre all that internet, nothing. So she gets to the club. She's parked on Spring Street. You know, it's not a place you'd want to park for very long. <laughs> and, and I go run to the car. Mom, you won't believe it. Jello Bianca, he said he'll take the smallest food for it. You know, you, I can go to the gate. You know, like, so like, you gotta come back, come back around the back and meet him, you know? And so <laughs> my mother and I go around the side of the clubs in the back by the dumpsters. And I'm like, mom, this is Jella Biafra. Jella, this is mom, you know, and to her credit and, and to Jella's credit, it, it all went down. She, she let it go. She was like, all right, okay. And she's really not happy with she wow. home. And, uh, and I got to see the gig, but that's the kind of stuff you have to go through just to be out of the gig. So it was really great when the Metroplex opened up and, uh, and we could just do our thing. We didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. They didn't have a bar. They didn't have any of that when they first started. The Metro Place had just a freaking stage that was, you know, less than the height of your average curb on a city street. <laughs> You're not right. There may as well have been no stage. You know what I'm saying? You could, you could like, but it was great. It was great. And that's where it really got going. And that's uh, ADOC kind of broke up in late summer, like around September 83. And that's when I met the guys who had become Neon Christ. And that's when it really hit overdrive. That's when, that's when it really, the, what happened before with ADOC was very important and pivotal. But what happened with Neon Christ, that's where you start seeing the story that most people know, that know about me or know about hardcore, know about that scene. That's where it really began right there. 
And and what did you guys think when that changing of the guard happened in like the late '80s? Like, what did you think of that next wave of bands? Because I didn't even see, like, I didn't even see um, my 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 cousin Lisa. Shout out to Lisa. She worked at a video store, so I actually got to rent the decline of western civilization i think it was in like probably 90 80 late 89 early 90 but and i was the same way i thought oh my god dei that's so cool like have it stand for something tsol um all those bands but then i was i was uh talking to my cousin who was like well you got to check out these bands and then also people in school were like yo if you think that's heavy wait till you hear agnostic front and chromax but what is what is what did you think of that second wave of bands Oh, you know, um, some of it I knew about, some of it I, I did, like, I, I'm, I'm, depending on where you define where the second wave starts, uh, you know, obviously I knew of Agnostic Front. I mean, I, I actually, I actually saw them in New York with, uh, Scream, uh, playing at CBGB's. It was probably wow. four. And that was a strange bill because at that time, Agnostic Front was very sort of aligned with the skinhead thing. And the skinhead thing was itself somewhat aligned with, you know, kind of a neo-fascist, neo-Nazi thing. And so, you know, there was just an element in the crowd that that gig that was just there to fuck shit up. You know, like that was their that was their motto, their mantra. <laughs> and, so, and then you had Scream, who were much more all about the music and it was much you know what i'm saying they were just this dynamic really cool band if anybody doesn't know about screen they should they were just one of the greatest bands out of washington dc and this was then when they had a five-piece lineup so it was the original four guys you know with kent stacks on drums um the, some people know about scream because dave Grohl played in screen before he joined nirvana but this is way before that way before that Ken Stacks was the original guy and he was with him for years and years. And, uh, so he had the four guys, you know, Franz, Pete, you know, the Stahl brothers, and he had Ski on bass, Ken on drums. And then they had Harley, this guy, Harley, they called Harley Davidson <laughs> on guitar, on second guitar. And, and they were, man, the four piece lineup of screen was really amazing. The five piece lineup of screen was just amazing. Plus, you know what I'm saying? Like it was so cool. And, um, and I remember how they dealt with just the weird dynamic in the crowd. We had some people that were there to see Scream and just kind of there, you know, just for the music and the whole thing. And then you had this other faction that was just more about, you know, kind of trying to start, start, start something and trying to start something up, see where it goes, you know? And, uh, yeah, it was a trip, man. It was really a trip. Um, but that's so yeah, I knew about Agnostic Front and 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 the Chromags later, later on. Um, but you know, around eighty seven, I kind of started uh getting into other things. Like I, I you know, I joined Blast. Like after New York Christ and that whole arc of <laughs> that whole story arc played itself out. Uh early eighty six, Neon on Christ broke up. Um Late 86, I moved across the country to Santa Cruz, California to join a group called Blast. And yeah. uh, that was a whole other thing. That was West Coast hardcore. That was a whole, I mean, you talk about one extreme to the other. I mean, in Atlanta, you know, it was a, it was an event if we had like more than, you know, 150 people at a show, you know what I mean? In LA, <laughs> There were a lot of shows where it was 3,000 people, you know, you, there were shows where you had multiple pits happening, you know, you know, you know just swarms of people and shows that taking place in venues like the Olympic Auditorium, you know, like it was just, it's a whole different scale of everything. And, and same goes from San Francisco. It was like, you know, we play in the Bay Area and an average show there might be. 500,000 people, you know, we, we played a lot in DI actually blast blast and DI had a really DI really loved blast and we really dug DI. So we did a lot of shows together. Um, and man, I mean, just sea of people, you know? Um, but anyway, I say all that said, that, well, that scene I think was more advantageous to, uh, less violence and more kind of fun i feel like because especially in the tape trading in the seven inch days i would get compilations like i got a compilation i think with blast and dr no and a bunch of bands on there 
Oh, yeah. Do- Dr. No had a song called Mr. Freeze. I must have played that seven inch till it was, you will die on your knees by the hands of Mr. Freeze. I, I, I have it here somewhere. But I remember hearing the West Coast bands and thinking like, yeah, this is, I love the West Coast bands, but I was more drawn to the, the like what you're saying, the volatile, like, I think Rollins even quoted a, like called AF, like the fuck you era of bands where it's just like, fuck everybody, fuck you, let's go fight and get crazy. I loved that stuff more so, but I know what you're saying. It's like there was a more sort of cohesive scene on the West Coast. Even when I started first touring in the early 90s and mid 90s, the shows were always bigger once once you got out to California. But that was bands like Strife and Ignite. And so I'm always interested in hearing about those bands that were before them, the the No For An Answers and the uniform choices and blast and the oxnard scene and the that even san diego right had a had a had a pretty big scene so when you would play with di that was that was like by the point where those bands from the first decline of western civilization some of them had quote unquote sold out right or quote unquote signed there like circle jerks was like i remember hearing they signed to a major label and people are all mad, but that record's not even that bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I try I, again. Uh, learning what I learned from, I mean, people call Black Flag sellouts. You know, they're they're sleeping on people's floors. You know, like when they get to a town, they they an indulgence for them was booking one hotel room for like fifteen guys. You know what I'm saying? And, right. And you know, several of them would sleep in the van or like I said, Rollins would sleep in the rider truck with the PA. He had a little coffin sized space for himself amidst all these heavy PA cabinets stacked all around him and underneath him. Um, so yeah, that was the big sellout, you know? So I never paid attention to any of that stuff. It was all just silly to me. Um, and I, I knew the reality and I saw through it, but you know, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly the West coast scene in my experience was just bigger. You had, within it just enormous um uh, sort of uh you just, there were there were many scenes in one I like subgenre is, is what i saw it was like you had i mean look the the whole black flag was known for kind of spearheading the harder faster louder kind of you know la punk in the very beginning was much more artsy you know and i noticed that with a lot of uh punk scenes the history of them kind of follows this similar trajectory where it starts out more art nerd you know kind of thing and then as it grows you have other elements coming into it that bring a a more um you know rambunctious uh often violent kind of dynamic to it you know to the audience to the audiences to the to the to the bands to the whole scene um and that happened in la i mean the early la scene was uh you know bands like the the weirdos you know um you know what i mean you had the screamers you had like you know the germs they were just these weird you know kids just it was playing a bunch of noise kind of you know but darby crash was a great poet through underneath all that but then the beach bands hermosa beach black flag that's where you know that's where the early descendants that's like and it's just a different dynamic and and with that came a different crowd and they came these surfer guys, these skater guys, they were more ambunctious. And it started a whole different thing happening. And and I saw that when I got to the West Coast. I saw, oh, now this beach element, this, I mean, Glass was a surf band in many respects. They were surfers and skaters, you know? These were guys that were, they weren't, they weren't art geeks. They were, they were a different thing. They, they were more, you know, they they had misfit elements, but they were basically like these these athletic guys who would get out in the ocean and surf, and they'd get on a skateboard and tear it up, and and, uh, and they brought that energy to the music. And they loved Black Flag, and they loved some Black Sabbath, and they loved some SSD Control, and you know, so that's what made the blast sound. And I related to all that because that's similar to what I was doing in Atlanta with the Iron Christ. So. We brought that kind of thing to that music, but on a larger scale, when you would look out and see two, 3,000 kids, you were looking and you were seeing, oh, 
There's a bunch of art geeks out here. There's a bunch of, you know, little kids who just want to kind of watch the music and not get killed. <laughs> and then you had huge numbers of people who were capable of tremendous damage. And they're, they're mixing it up out there on the floor, you know? I always think of like uh, uh, the photographer Mouse. And she and I recently reconnected after, God, 30 years or whatever. Wow. More. But Mouse was this girl, man, who would be in the audiences taking pictures, man. And with often with those big honking camera, you know, like, again, when cameras were cameras, you know, not just a little thing in your phone. And she'd be out there in some of the craziest, toughest situations. Girl, 15, 16 years old, just, you know, in it. You know what I mean? Courageous, courageous. And, wow. um, you know, but I, I think of, all the different kinds of people in the crowd. So you had everybody from Mouse to, you know, the straight up psychopath <laughs> who just would come to the show just to get crazy and just to let it all out and uh, and everything in between. So yeah, it was, a, it was a cool time for sure. Very, a lot of adventures. What's going on everybody? Our sponsor, one of our best sponsors for, for not just the Milwaukee Metal Fest uh, coming up this month, in uh in milwaukee at the rave eagles but uh, also of the jossa show i'm talking about indie merch and the link to go to after the podcast today is indiemerchstore.com they're one of the best longest supporters of the show you know them you love them and right now thy artist murder is is back with a brand new split ep with fit for an autopsy and malevolence and it's available at indiemerchstore.com when you use the code pro, the promo code jossa 10 you're going to save 10 percent off your order You'll see the Aggression Sessions is available on limited edition LP, CD, and they have brand new merch to support this killer release. The bands cover Cannibal Corpse's, uh, well, The Artist Murder covers Cannibal Corpse's Hammer Smash Face, and it, it does fucking rule. I played it on the music show on my Patreon, and people were bugging out because they do it like really true to the old school way. It's It sounds sick. It's not like a deathcore version. Oh, it's yeah. like them doing it the old school death metal way. It's, it's fucking badass. That's awesome. Yeah, it's killer. Go to IndieMerchStore.com. Once again, the promo code is JOSTA10 for 10% off all your merch. All right, baby. Now back to the show. Were you in the band with Joey C and Nick Oliveira at that era? Or you're in... Oh, we're talking 30 years before that or whatever. Like, we're talking 86. You're talking with Cliff was the singer and... Yeah, so... so Because so, I had... I remember the kid at the record Desmore, store. Clifford Densmore, Mike Nider, Bill Torgerson, and Dave Cooper. And me, and and I, it was it was interesting because I actually uh, replaced, if you will, Steve Stevenson, who was kind of like, kind of the the main musical force in that group at the at with the the first Blast album is pretty much all songs musically written by Steve Stevenson, and the 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 really wild thing is, early '86. I knew my band Near Christ was about to break up. I just, I knew it, you know? Things had gotten too heavy. The scene in Atlanta had grown very rapidly, largely around us. Um, there was one other group that was really cool and important, DDT, but, you know, Neon Christ kind of became the focus of a lot of um, attention, shall we say. Like, you know, the skinhead factions grew up in Atlanta just like they did at most other cities around the country they sort of targeted us i think they just sort of saw us as some sort of i don't know threat to whatever they wanted to represent or something i don't know then the police also targeted the air christ a lot and i could never quite put together what that was about either but they would stake out our rehearsal space they would they would they were they would raid our gigs i mean it was it was, it was getting nuts and you know people were getting hurt and I heard different things about, you know, hits being put out on me and stuff. And it just it was too, I'm 17 years old, man. You know what I'm saying? I just wanted to play guitar and rock. You know what I mean? I wanted to write some songs. And now we're getting this nonsense. So I was like, I, I, I need a change of scenery. I want to go, I want to leave and I want to go somewhere completely different. And I'd heard the first album by this group called Blast. I'd gotten it on Green World Records, you know, and I really liked it. 
they were they were one of the few kind of newer bands that I thought, oh, this is really cool, you know? And yeah, they had a kind of heavy black flag influence, but I also heard the SSD, I heard the 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 Sabbath, and and they kind of were doing their own thing within all that too. I just really dug it. So I actually wrote them a letter. <laughs> this is back when you, you know, you did that. You took a piece of paper and a freaking pen and you wrote a letter and sealed it up in an envelope and nailed it with a stamp. Yeah. Remember that? So anyway, I did that and I got an answer a few weeks later. And Steve Stevenson wrote me back. And I and I knew the, you know, obviously I knew the personnel of the band from the record, but I also knew Steve was kind of the the guy writing most of that music, you know? And I was like, oh, cool, you know? And it was totally cool. Like a total, totally awesome pen pal letter, the way those things used to happen back then, you know? And one of the things I had expressed in my letter to him or to them, to the to Blast, was, you know, my band is breaking up. And I'm looking for something to do. I'm looking, I'm looking for a change of scenery and it's probably a long shot, but I'm just putting it out there. If, if, if any, if, if any of you guys feel like making a change and you're looking for somebody, I'd be very interested, you know, and I think what I do would mesh very well with what you do. And we're, we're kind of among the very, very few people in the country and in the world who really understand these specific kinds of sonics we're doing. So I'd be really interested if, if, if you guys ever were and sent it off. And he sent black, you know, the letter and it was really super cool. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, like the thing is we've been together kind of since, you know, middle school, elementary school. And they had, they had, they started skating together when they were little kids. And then they kind of grew up together in this band. And, uh, so he's like, you know, so we're really tired. I don't think anybody's going to leave anytime soon, but you know, man, that's super cool. We'd love to meet you. And, all that stuff. If we ever get a chance, it'd be great. And, 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 you know, and I really was looking for a change of scenery specifically to go to the West coast. And, and around the same time, Henry Rollins came through town, through Atlanta on his first sort of speaking tour. And so he was really hand to mouth. It is not at all <laughs> like the theater filling, you know, like really like super, you know, refined show that he does now. This was the very, very, very bare bones, minimal punk rock version of that. And he came through Atlanta and he needed a place to stay at the end of the gig. So he crashed at my, with me at my parents' house, slept on my floor in my room with, with me there, you know, like wow. I'm in my fucking trundle bed. He's <laughs> crashed out on the floor. And, um, and the next day, you know, we got up and, and, he and Davo, who was Black Flag sound man, who was traveling with him for his uh, solo run, uh, they got in a car and uh, and bailed. But we were talking before that about you know, man, I, I just I'm looking for something to do. It's getting crazy here in Atlanta, and I, I want to go. You know, do you think there's anything happening around the SST scene? Because I'd known those guys for a couple years by this point. I knew them pretty well, and I would talk to Dukowski on the phone a lot. I would talk to Greg Ginn a lot on the phone. The last Black Flag tour, he and I spent the whole day together because he wanted to jam all the time, and so did I. So we went to Neon Christ rehearsal space and played all day. It was me, Greg Ginn, Cell, who was the the last bass for the Black Flag, and Simeon Kane on drums, who was the drummer in Gone, Ginn's instrumental band at that time, and then became the drummer of the Rollins band soon after that. So it was a, it was us just jamming all day, just instrumental improv all day long. And so I was really, had a lot of energy and I was looking for something to do. And I was asking Rollins about it, like, man, you think there's anything out there for me? And and so anyway, I was, all that to say, I was just looking for something. And I'll be darned if just a few months after that, that I wrote that letter to Blast and it got the really cool response back saying, yeah, you know, I don't think so, but you know, a few months later, I'm hanging out with Reed Mullen, God rest his soul, COC. They were like a, they were brothers with Neon Christ. We were, I mean, true brother bands. They were from Raleigh. We we're from Atlanta. We we're, you know, five, six hours apart. It's the Southeast. In the early 80s in the Southeast, you really risk your, you risk your safety and life and limb to even do the kind of music we were trying to do. You know what I mean? 
So yeah. we found out about them very early on. They found out about us very early on. We played a lot of shows together. We would headline when we played in Raleigh with them. They'd headline when they came to Atlanta with us. And this was like I for an I era going into Animosity, which to me is still one of the classic records of all time. I remember seeing them play all that stuff before it was out, you know? And then when it came out, it was just like, oh my God, this is the record right now. And these are my friends, you know? So we were, it was a super cool time, like 84-ish, you know? Um, but so I'm hanging out with Reed. This is now, you know, summer 86. And we hung out a lot together. But this time he came down to Atlanta to go see Run DMC play the Omni. And we were, you know, we were both really into a lot of the early uh, rap stuff. And Run DMC was, was a, a band we both really wanted to see. So I went to that show with him. And afterward, he's taking me home. Again, at this time, I still didn't have a car. And so he drove me home to my parents' house in the COC van. And as we're pulling onto my street, she's like, you know, I, uh, I, I, just, I heard from the guys in Blast. And uh, Steve left the band. And they want you. You know, I was like, what? You know, like, uh, Steve, Steve's the guy that is kind of the main musical force of that band. The guy who wrote me back saying, yeah, you know, we've all been together so long, been together since we were little kids. You know, I don't think so. I don't think, but he's leaving. He's leaving? Like, it was just the craziest thing. I was like, yeah, he's leaving. So next thing I know, man, I swear, it was probably like a week, two weeks, maybe. I packed up everything I had and was on a plane <laughs> wow. to San Francisco to go to Santa Cruz, you know, Clifford Dinsmore. And I, and, and, uh, I think maybe his brother picked me up at the airport or maybe Clifford and like Dave Cooper. But anyway, next thing I know, I'm in Santa Cruz living in a fucking closet, you know, cause that was, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys toured you, in you, that house and you toured with them until the breakup and did, did gigs and, um, or, or did you leave and join oh, another band? Yeah. So, yeah, my time in Blast was during the It's In My Blood. I recorded that record, It's In My Blood, with them. But then I left bef right before that record came out. So we got signed by SST, which was, you know, just could get better than that, right? That was just, that was it, right? They were the label. And, uh, you know, Chuck Dukowski and Greg Ginn themselves, like, came to one of our gigs and, you know, we're sitting in the van again, playing them our demo tape of our new material that we had been working up in the rehearsal space. And it was just a boom box recording, no vocals on it, just the mic hanging from the ceiling and just the music, you know? And, uh, and he's in the van, you know, nodding, you know, and, you know, probably smoking a little something because he always smoked weed back then. Probably still does. But, uh, <laughs> and, and at the end, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, you know? And then we were signed. <laughs> to like our favorite label by like the guy you know and uh and that was that probably your goal with neon christ like you probably w oh would have signed in a heartbeat right? oh my god yes oh yeah oh yeah so um so uh, you know it was really cool and we went in the studio we recorded it's in my blood and like you know pretty much like a day <laughs> you know it was just set up live just do it you know and then I, most of the music was recorded seriously in like a day. But then there were overdubs and, and Clifford, you know, working out his lyrics and going in and, and, and doing his, his vocals and stuff. But like a very short period of time. And, uh, and then between then, that period where we finished the recording and its imminent release, I left the group. Um, because, you know, there were just a lot of things going on and, and I really, I really missed my, my home and my friends in Atlanta. I mean, I was still a kid, my first time living away from home. I didn't go to college in that traditional sense of, you know, I'm right out of high school and I'm going to college in another city in another state. I didn't do any of that. My college essentially was freaking blast and all the craziness that went with that. And so, um, I was really, I also missed being kind of like the driving force in a band. Like every band, I that was the first band I ever joined. I've only joined two bands in my life, Blast and Allison Chains. Every other band, I formed it from the ground up. I picked this guy, I picked that guy. I was like, you guys got to come with me. We got to do this. And so I missed that. I really did. 
And, um, and by that point, I had a whole scene kind of in Atlanta around, around what I was doing. You know what I mean? It's, it's hard to leave that and, um, and be away from it for a long time. And so I had kind of lived out a lot of adventures and I was kind of, yeah, I, I think I need to move on. And so, and interestingly, Mike Dean from COC was feeling exactly the same way about his group, the, a band that he had started, you know, with Reed and Woody. He was feeling the same way. He was like, yeah, I just can't, I, you know, I can't make these guys more. I want to, I want to, I want to leave. I want to do something else. COC was coming out to Berkeley. They were playing in Berkeley at that time. And I think it was the last show of this particular run. Those guys toured all the time. They were, they were a little bit older than me and my friends. And they, they always, I just, I envied them so much because I was like, man, God, I wish Neon Christ could could do what they're doing, but we just weren't there. We just weren't, we weren't old enough. And we did a tour, but it was a whole other story. You know, before I could legally drive a car, before our drummer, Jimmy Dean, could legally drive a car. It was, it was a whole crazy fiasco and it was fun, but it was crazy. But COC was a touring machine. They were touring like Black Flag tour. They were touring like I wanted to tour. And so they were, they were ending one of their endless tours in Berkeley. And Mike was like, I had enough. So I was like, I've had enough too. So we're like, and I, and I was like, and I've got this idea for a group. I want to go back to Atlanta and I want to form a group called The Final Offering because it's going to be my last thing that I do that's kind of in this vein of music, in this genre of music. I feel like I got one more fuel burn left with this kind of thing, this kind of certain kind of aggressive rock that I've been doing since I was, you know, 15. One more burn and I want you to do it with me. I want to, I want to go. And I got this drummer in Atlanta that would be perfect for this. Greg Somas from DDT, who I mentioned earlier, they were the only other band kind of like Neon Christ in that, in that way. And Greg was like the Keith Moon or Chuck Biscuits of Atlanta. He was just a fucking savage. He would, he was like working some shit out on the drums. You know what I'm saying? There's drummers and there's yeah. skilled drummers on. Then there's those guys that they've experienced some kind of something in their life and they're working it out on the drums. And it's like the drums are, that thing or that person or those people who did wrong by them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they're just, it's like they're having a session every time they're behind the drums. And Greg was that guy. You know, he'd lose, he'd, he'd leave while he's playing drums. You know what I'm saying? And I wanted that guy. I loved, I loved him. He's, he's also no longer with us. And, uh, and I just loved him. So, Mike Dean and I made this plan to drive back to Atlanta together. And I, I bought a 56 Volkswagen Beetle, 500 bucks. So all the money I had and, uh, and I, I cash is handed to a guy and I had this, I was kind of into Volkswagens and I had this vague dream of maybe one day restoring that car, you know, but when I bought it, it was an absolute hunk of junk. It had the original six volt engine in it. Had holes rusted all through the floor. Had no seatbelts. The seatbelts were all rotted out. It was, it was a freaking wreck. But I bought it and I was going to drive it all the way across the country <laughs> with Mike Dean, who <laughs> at that time, let's just say, had done a lot of psychedelics. Yeah. And who had, who had a real aversion to pulling onto the on ramp of a highway. He was okay once you got on the highway, <laughs> but he just couldn't get it together to actually do the on-ramp onto the highway. So that's what I was doing. And we drive from, from uh, Berkeley or, you know, Santa Cruz, Berkeley, Bay Area to Pomona. We knew, or he knew a guy who we could stay with for that night. From there, we was going to do the, the run to Phoenix. We were going to hit the 10 and start east. And that north south that 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 north south run was just one of the craziest drives of my life because the fog rolls in off the ocean. We we took PCH for a lot of it. The fog was so intense you could literally stick your hand outside the car and disappear. It was like that. And this car, like I said, six volt engine. It's puttering along. There are lawnmowers that go faster than this fucking car, <laughs> and like nothing worked you know what i'm saying it was one of those things nothing worked like the uh, the even the headlights they were like cross-eyed you know the beams had, it was useless so i'm driving this all the way down the west coast all the way down basically the state of california 
that was fun. Then we get where we're going. And <laughs> just, I need to recover. It was just, oh God, that took a lot out of me, you know? And uh, so I was like, Mike, you know, are you going to be cool to do like the, the next little leg here? Like, you know, at least get us part of the way to Phoenix. And he was like, yeah, you know, so we make this plan to drive at night because he has such an aversion to, you know, just highway driving in general. Right. And so we, we set off in the evening and we start our way and we had now, mind you, everything I owned, everything I had was packed in this car. I actually left gear on the West coast. I, I could, I couldn't fit it. It was like, I had, I had a sixties Marshall head, like a plexi head. And I had like some other stuff and I was like, I just, Take it, you know. What I mean, like, I gave it to this kid, Patrick. I was like, just take this, you know. I don't, I don't like, but everything I could fit into the car was in the car. So I had both of my Dan Armstrong guitars. I had all my clothes. I mean, we were literally like encased in my possessions, you know. And Mike had like a duffel bag, I think, and that was about it. But and I had a uh, my motorcycle jacket, my my shot brand leather jacket, Ramones leather jacket, hanging kind of in the driver's side, uh, you know, it was, there was a little hook there and I could just get it up there and sort of shove it into the hook. And it was hanging like a little curtain right here. If you were driving the car, it was right here. And so we had one, we had a boom box and we had two cassette tapes. And one was this live Grateful Dead tape that Mike Dean had because he just <laughs> loved him some Grateful Dead. And, uh, and then the other was David Bowie, the man who sold the world. And we listened to those tapes ad nauseum and just constant repeat. So we're driving at night toward Phoenix. It's pitch black. We're in the desert. Mike is listening to his Grateful Dead tape. I am kind of, you know, hunched into the passenger seat, kind of trying to get some sleep, but not really very successful in that. And I'm drifting in and out. I mean, I was exhausted, drifting in and out. At one point, I hear and feel that the rumble strip on. Yeah, man. So I'm like, oh, God, you know, I'm jarred out of my semi horrible sleep. And I look over and Mike D is just like, oh, Mike, God. hands on the wheel. The car is going as fast as it will go, which was a, a robust 65 <laughs> miles an hour on the straightaway. And so. We're, we're, you know, kind of flying. I mean, for that car, it's flying, you know, and he's knocked out. And I go, Mike. And he goes, and when he did this, that was the end of it, boy. We fucking, like, we just did one of these, you know? So we kind of lurched this way. And then the car just flit end over end over end over end off the highway. And, you know, this was, I don't know if it's still like this, but in those days, it was kind of a downward trajectory into the desert floor. <laughs> yeah. We kind of uh, a bit off the side and down into the desert. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. And so Mike got thrown out of the car in the first roll because next thing I know, I'm where he was. I'm in the driver's seat and I got to stay for the whole ride. <laughs> and so I'm just flipping end over end, all my stuff's flying past me, all my stuff's flying out of the car and 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 I'm getting sand and all kind of rocks hit me in the face and shit. And like and then at a certain point the car kind of comes to a it it, it 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 it's it's on its side, but it's still skating. So it's on the driver's side. So I'm kind of pinned down like this. And my face is right up against that leather jacket that I had. And oh, thank God, because if it had not been, that would have been my face against the desert floor, right? So the jacket literally saved me, you know? Wow. And I come to a stop and I'm looking up through the car and the sun's just starting to come up. So I'm looking at kind of like pre-dawn sky and I'm, it takes a minute to realize I'm not dead. You know what I'm saying? Because I really, as I'm, rolling end over end it's like being in a dryer you know what i mean but with really hard objects and stuff flying into the dryer <laughs> like, nah. and, and i'm thinking i'm gonna die i'm gonna die um 
uh, yeah, this is it. I'm 19 years old. Hadn't even made it to 20. And I'm going to wow. die in the fucking desert in a car I bought for 500 bucks. This is how we're going out. And I, I just was thinking that I was like, and you know, there's this weird kind of acceptance. It's really strange. And then when I stopped and I wasn't dead, I'm looking up through the car and I'm like, God, can I move? What's good? Cool? Like, am I, you know, is anything broken? Like what's happening? You know, and I'm trying to kind of cry myself free of all the junk that's laying on me and you know, whatever. And, and uh, before I can really get free, I, I just go, Mike. And he goes, I hear way in the distance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, man. We both made it. I, I can't believe it. And so I pry myself free and I kind of stand up through the car and I climb out of the wreckage and I look and I see Mike Dean walking toward me in the desert. <laughs> He's so lucky. You guys are so lucky to be alive. I'm telling you. And so, and then I look over and in the desert, there's like a freaking kind of a, like a dune, I guess, like a little sand hill or whatever. In that is one of my Dan Armstrongs stuck in the ground, like fucking Excalibur, right? One where his head stock first is in the ground, like a spear. It come out of the case and wedged itself in the ground like that. And, and all my other stuff's scattered all over the desert, all over the place. And I look at, and I look at the car and the car is obviously demolished. And the door, the driver's side door was kind of bent into this pretzel, right? Underneath the wreckage. So again, that's what I was laying on. You know what I mean? So I'm very lucky. I might get thrown out of the car, very lucky. And so we're standing there amidst all this. And, you know, you just kind of in a daze and you're just kind of thinking like, wow, you know, and in a, like a surprisingly small amount of time, given the circumstances, someone comes sort of to check on us. It was really a trip. This truck driver who was going the opposite way, he's heading west on the 10. He saw a glint out of his rear view mirror and it was the glint of the wreckage. And he turned around, got off the highway, turned around, came back. You know those exits, they can be miles apart. So this guy was way out of his way on whatever route he was on, where the job was on. He went up, he turned around, he came back, he pulled over. He was like, yeah, oh, okay, you guys all right? You know, and he he, he made the calls to the, to the emergency, you know, uh, personnel and all that. And uh, it was just such a crazy thing, man. And and that's that's kind of how... My time in blast ended and my time in the final offering began. <laughs> because, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. So how did you get back to Atlanta? How'd you get back to these coasts? So we got to the hospital in Tonopah, Arizona, because <laughs> we didn't make it to Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> the emergency guys came, they drove us to Tonopah. Somebody came that towed my wreckage of a vehicle and we got to the hospital and we first thing almost like even before we were seen by anybody because i mean we had minor injuries i think mike had a nosebleed uh i got no broken face. bones no broken bones he rolled it's, yeah it's 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 totally insane but i had like a a, a a gash right here and uh and and i had like uh one of my nails got ripped off right through my shoe i had these really cheap chinese like canvas uh, loafer type shoes on, you know? And, um, so, but that was it. And so we get to the waiting room and we immediately get to the payphone and we call SST because they know everybody. And, you know, that was, they were back then there were a few, um, sort of nationwide connectors, you know what I'm saying? And, and SST was one of the main ones. Chuck Dukowski was one of the main ones. And we got Dukowski on the phone. We said, man, you know, yeah, we just crashed and uh, we're, we're, we crashed a few miles outside of Tonopah and uh, we're in this hospital and, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And, and like, and he freaked out on the phone because he's like, what? Tonopah? That's right where D. Bruin got killed from Minutemen. Almost really? the exact same spot and under the almost the exact same circumstances. He was in a van. His girlfriend was driving. She fell asleep at the wheel. 
she crashed the van and Deepu got thrown out of the van. And unfortunately for him, he hit a telephone pole head first. Oh my God. That's how he, 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 uh, died. And we were in almost the exact same time. He was just like, whoa, man. And so he found a house for us to stay in. And we, we crashed there for a couple of days after we got out of the hospital. And then, you know, I had to make that call that no one wants to make. I had to call my folks, man. And I was like, yeah, I crashed. Yeah. You know, and, uh, that's how I got home. I, I, I got a, I got a, a play ticket home and then had to just, you know, take stock of, of all of that, you know, especially your boy and folks will really make you take stock. Cause it's like, yeah, okay. So you, you know, this crazy noise music you're playing and you know, look what it, you know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. And then I went right ahead and formed another one. <laughs> I please, I have to get you on for a part two because we didn't even get to the nineties. We didn't even get to my my shaking Jerry's hand at Grass Pop when he had the rings on, and I I've told the story a hundred times on the podcast where, and I was gonna ask you if you've ever witnessed him go ah you know like you you shook my hand too hard. There's so much I want to get into and with you. Can you that. you have? Oh yeah, I've witnessed that now. <laughs> Of course I'm weird. Because yeah, I've had because I had Zach Wilde and Joey Belladonna from Anthrax witness my oh uh, it was bad. I really you know, I like a firm handshake. I go in, I try to go in strong. But please, please, William, I, I want to get into the nineties and, and everything else with you. Will you come on for a part two? I've already kept you th- too long. Oh, but yeah, be out to you. Um yeah. But yeah. this is this really and I gotta animate this story. We have to do an <laughs> animated version. Of you and Mike Dean and the man, and I don't want to talk about Poison Planet. When I went to Mike Dean, I was like, "How come we don't play Poison Planet?" I got it. There's so much I want to go through with you, um, but but we have to cut it here. And yeah. thank you so much for the time. Really quick, let me. I just want. I do need to plug the new single with the Who though. That oh works. yes, yeah. This is Mongol Warrior Souls, out now. It, I mean, it's currently at number eleven on Active Rock and. Uh, we're just so happy about that. I, I not only performed on it, you know, sang, play guitar and bass and all that stuff, but I also produced and mixed it. And uh, we're just really proud of that record and so glad that it's doing so well. Yeah, congrats. And we're and and, and the vinyl release for Neon Christ is still available. Uh, where can... There might be a few copies of that left. And if there are, they would be through Southern Lord, uh, you know, the Southern Lord web store. Um, so yeah, just look up Southern Lord recordings. I think it's southernlord.com is the website, but look that up. And, uh, if there are any left, it would, that would be where you could get them, but they, it, I don't know if there, <laughs> if there are any, <laughs> if there are just the CDs, <laughs> just the CD, just the CDs then. Probably. There are no CDs. We only did. Oh. And so I'm actually thinking about, because that vinyl release was a partnership between my label DVL recordings and Southern Lord. Um, cause Greg's been a, a, a fan and a bro for many, many years, going going back to my Neon Christ and Blast days. So he just really wanted to partner on this. And and I was going to do it on my own. And then when he wanted to partner, I was like, yeah, man, that would, if there's anybody I partnered with, it would be you on something like this. So it was perfect. Um, but yeah, I plan on actually, DVL is going to put the Neon Christ material out on CD because we actually never did that. We, we were a totally analog band. And even this reissue, we stayed all analog. We 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 have never been a digital band. It's never been on the streaming services, and it's never been on CD. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to fix that probably this year. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time, and I hope to have you back soon. I'm gonna try to schedule it right away because there's just so much other stuff I want to get into. But this was amazing, and we have to get that animated. We ha- <laughs> I have to reach out and put that out. I'd like to be so kind. You ever, do, <laughs> you ever do that? I'd like to see it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, thank you, William. Appreciate you, man. Have a good one. Quick little outro for that ass. And thank you, everybody. If you are subscribed over at gasdigital.com, you will see there's a lot of updates over there. We got some new shows. And those of you who wrote me about not being able to download the MP3s or whatever, however you do that when you when you download our episodes early, that function is coming back. And if you if you were subscribed and you're not subscribed anymore and you want to come back, 
get another free trial or, or yeah, and just cool check it website. out and see if you enjoy the site, right? Same, same promo code, right? Just use the code JASTA. Promo code JASTA. Get you a seven-day free trial and about 10% off your monthly membership. Yeah, and you'll see all the shows up there. You'll see the schedule. You'll see, um, you know, uh, we got um, we got a lot of new Jasta shows up there. I'm trying to click through on it right now. Let's see. We there's like we got like eight episodes up right now for subs. Yeah, we're we're way ahead of uh, of what you guys have out in the public world. So sign up at guestdigitalnetwork.com. You can get them way ahead of time. And if you want even more content, go to patreon.com slash Josta. You'll see I just did a very controversial episode about a front man who oh, uh, really yeah, who uh, we could never do this on that. We would get thrown off of YouTube, but uh, a front man of a band who uh, supposedly commits suicide. But there was an article recently that came out. And now the woman who wrote the article is uh, is being seen on Twitter and Instagram with the family of said singer. It's very interesting. Is this I'm extremely famous uh from the yes 90s. And, I, and i and i'm trying to get a hold of this woman to see if she'll come on the patreon show we probably couldn't do her Roger on the, that probably couldn't have her on the real show right now because no mainstream music publish publication has uh has has really even looked into this or talked about it anyways patreon.com slash josta and uh, thank you to indie store.com use a promo code josta 10 you'll save 10 percent off and make sure you go and see all the killer bands on the indie merch store stage at this year's milwaukee metal fest the return of milwaukee metal fest the tickets are starting to fly which is awesome we we sold enough tickets to confirm that we will be back in 2024 so that is height yeah that's it's huge man and and you know a lot of people watched that episode with craig from forbidden and were psyched on this new they, first of all they were psyched on the episode and they were psyched on this new version of forbidden possibly forbidden. doing milwaukee next year that's awesome right like who that was great i love yeah. doing that yeah, I, w- I was pumped because, you know, when we do some of these episodes, you never know when you're going to catch the the moment or the algorithm. And and Bobby Blitz was another one. People are like you have to get overkill for 2024. They're, they're having a moment right now. And and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's awesome to see these these legacy thrash bands are getting more interest than ever currently, which is which is cool. And I'm glad we can be a part of it. Um Thank you to again, indie promo code Josta 10. But thank you to Monarch Heavy. They have a killer band, uh, Somnuri, that's going to be playing the pre-party for Milwaukee Metal Fest with yours truly. I'll be up there with Paul Bostaff from Slayer, Kirk from Crowbar, Dino from Fear Factory, Phil Demmel from Violence, Tim Ripper Owens, and many more. They can, uh, they're going to be offering their album. I think they're going to sell it at the show too, but you can pre-order it now if you're not coming to Milwaukee Metal Fest. Just go to go to monarchheavy.com and use the promo code 666. That's M-N-R-K heavy.com. Use the promo code 666. You'll save 15% off and you can pre-order the new Texas Hippie Coalition or and or the new Creeping Death album. You'll see it monarchheavy.com. And of course, martyrstore.net for all your meet and greet needs. If you want to intro a band, if you want to jam on stage with me, actually, I think that's sold out. I think the jam with Josta deal sold out and uh actually i should shout i should shout them out who's who's gonna be jamming with me let me see if i can pull that up real quick if you have a second we have it says david garres gareski gareski david send me the name we're trying over here man yeah (laughs) the pronunciation police are gonna come down on me for this one but dave hit me up Justin show at Gmail. We're looking forward to jamming with you or maybe it's your son or it's maybe someone in your family. Let us know who it is. We're going to have a good time. May 25th, the rave.com slash metal fest for tickets. And once again, uh, check out that Sam Nuri. They're going to be opening up. Come early, check them out and get their record over at monarchheavy.com. Promo code 666. What was the last one? Century Media. Can't forget about Century Media. Century Media dot store. No promo code needed. But you'll see. I mean, they got, they're killing it. They got Suicide Silence. They got Lorna Shore. They got Sanguasugabog, who's already, they, they could be the people's headliner for Sunday. I, I think that's, that's the, uh, that's the rumor over here. Yeah. And then Saturday, people are already saying Frozen Soul might be the people's headliner for Saturday. We'll see. Frozen Soul Glacial Domination. I think it's coming out May 4th or May 5th, but you can pre order it now. It's coming out this week. So get it, get it before they sell out. All those vinyl colors are going to sell out. Century Media dot store. All right, everybody. We appreciate you. 
who are we coming back with? We got to, we, well, we're going to, we're going to put out a, it won't be on video, but we will put out the Milwaukee metal fest music show this week, part three. So we'll put that up on the free feed and, Oh, we're going to be putting up some Rob Dukes podcasts up on the free feed. All right. So make sure Episodes you like subscribe, show? hit the bell. What do they do? If they see it on our feed, they got to just search Rob's show and then go and sub on his feed. Yeah. We'll put a link. Cool. And we'll All do right. we'll do a cold open so people aren't confused. But the next uh, few episodes we got coming up are metal. We got the dudes from Metal Church. Oh yeah, correct. Yep. Yeah. And then we got Monty Bar Monty Bernard from uh, Bleed the Sky. And then uh, Marty Monty was a great episode. It was that so was a good. Lot of fun. And then uh, Marty Friedman, Dave Lombardo, Brandon Boyd came on the show. That was a great episode, too. Yes. And we're going to have Brian Fair from Shadows Fall. Hopefully, we're going to have Rob from Machine Head and a bunch of other bands that are going to be playing at the fest. But yeah, we got a stacked next few weeks. Thank you all for the support. Drink your coffee, do your push ups, listen to death metal. Bye bye. All right, great. Produced by Brian McKay. Executive producers Jake Olszewski, Ben Lee, AJ Lewis, Garrett Keeping, Dan Smith. Nick Torito, JJ Hernandez, Joe Bartovic, Jason Jarvis, Chris Larice, Alex Smolin, Todd McKee, John Blewett, Richard Miller, Kyle Marg, Nate Leffingwell, Morgan Costner, Mark Tag, Zapagor Waikato, Niall Scollard, Kathy D'Ambrosio, Justin Steven, Jack Flanders, the Pit Commander. Andy Wilson, Jeffrey Kuhn, Kimo Humalamaki, Jonathan Metis, Brandon Cooper, Matthew Jankowskis, Jamie Kutcher, Ryan Undercoffler, Matt West, Ryan Maurice, Chad Green, Dallas Hendricks, Jacob Arensberg, Kenneth Moore, Kona Butterflies, Stephen Helm, Richard McIntosh, Jeff Stevenson, Ryan Williams, Larry Tooley, Dallas Bolin, Brian St, Nathan Rex Madrid, Cameron Hendricks, Scandalous Official, Joe Motson, Let's Talk Resident Evil, Andrew Chase, Guy on the Couch, Chris Winchester, Antonio Reyes, Joe Otson, Dustin Stone, Lee Walker, Ryan Levson, John Hankis, Robert Bushaw, Troy Seal, Mark Horror Armenta, Jay Liberston, Nick Fowler, Mike Horgan, Emma Horgan, Arnorock, Patrick King, Oscar Brummett, Stacy Steinecke, Fernando Somoza, Patrick O'Brien, Dominique Zimmer, Ryan Sanders, Lara Snyder, Daniel Burt, Milwaukee Metal Sausage, Adam Boss.